So good day, everyone. My name is Gyan Ramakrishna, and I serve as the general chair for the first reliability of electronics and photonics packaging symposium. This symposium started out with the simple thought of providing a platform for reliability in the evolving field of electronics, photonics, integration, and of packaging in the industry. It is humbling to see so many of our peers and thought leaders lined up through the today and tomorrow discussing relevant topics, and I look forward to learning from them and hope each one of us as attendees would also benefit while staying safe from where we are. Let me, without further ado, hand it over to Dr. Ephraim Sohir, who seeded the idea of the symposium earlier this year and serves as its keynote session chair. Okay, thank you for the introduction and good morning, at least here it's a good morning. And uh, uh, I will be chairing the first session and uh, uh, our first the speaker uh, will be uh, Christopher Bailey, and it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to introduce Chris. Uh, Chris Bailey, Professor Bailey, is president of our society and has served on the Society Board of Governors for over 10 years. And it's uh, particular, of course, uh, Chris Bailey is absolutely important for this event, but it's uh, he's particularly important because his uh, well-known group uh, focuses on reliability. It's not only general packaging, but with the emphasis on its on reliability. Uh, Chris is also director of the Computational Mechanics and Reliability Group in the University of Greenwich, London, UK, and he uh, published over 300 uh, papers and books uh, related to modeling the reliability of electronic packages. And uh, he has uh, 22 PhD students. He, he managed uh, to uh, work the research grants in the total amount of uh, 5 million pounds sterling uh, from the UK, Europe, the part of defense, this country, and industry sources. So uh, Chris Bailey has served on several UK government committees and is a member of uh, UK equivalent of the National Science Foundation in this country. Chris Bailey. Absolutely delighted to see this uh, event take place on reliability for electronics and photonics packaging. Uh, it's really, really good to see reliability uh, coming to the forefront here again uh, for the society. Okay, <clears throat> this brings me on to uh, my presentation. Um, and this details uh, some of the work my group has been involved in over a number of years in, in working with companies who are primarily in the very high reliability sector. And I'm going to talk today about uh, particular organizations who are very interested in electronics packaging um, in the aerospace sector, and this is primarily aeronauticals, but this could be applicable to oil and gas, uh, defense in general, very high reliability um, applications. Uh, but this is a very small market. Uh, for um, uh, semiconductor industry <clears throat> and providers of electronics of packages, whether they're BGA packages, QFNs, leading components. Um, uh, the, uh, this sector probably represents about 1% of the whole market for, for, for packages. So it's very small, but its demands are very high in terms of reliability. So there is this term, commercial off-the-shelf components. So really this is uh, buying packages that have not really been designed for this application. So how do you ruggedize those packages so you can ensure 
uh, that they would meet the reliability requirements of an electronic system or board that's in a, in a radar system that's inside of, uh, an aircraft. So I, I'm going to talk uh, uh, about some of these challenges uh, for this sector uh, and some of the work uh, that we've been doing at the University of Greenwich, working with companies uh, uh, in this sector. Uh, the contents of my talk, uh, first of all, I'll talk a bit about COPS, Commercial Off-the-Shelf Components. Um, uh, my group at the University of Greenwich very much focuses on uh, design modelling and simulation. Um, uh, we have a reliability lab as well, but our really focus, our real focus is on uh, modelling and simulation. And we work with industry to bring together um, uh, the, the modelling and the metrology. And I'll come on to, uh, in a moment to a bit more on the metrology side of things, but it really is bringing modelling and package and materials characterization together, uh, which is very important so that you could use uh, models, whether they're analytical models or finer element models at the early stages of design. So for an aerospace company, they've purchased certain COTS components, they need, need to ruggedize those components. For example, challenges could be due to tin whiskers that could grow due to high tin finishing or lead-free solders that could be uh, that would have been designed, uh, would have been the material of choice for the COTS component, but would not be uh, appropriate uh, for an aerospace application due to things like reliability concerns, uh, fatigue concerns in the long term, but also things like tin whiskers. So uh, I'll then go on to talk a bit about refinishing processes. So. Uh, this is where companies actually have to remove some of the finishing on components because they're, they're not suitable, as I just mentioned before. And there's hot solder dipping, or you could be uh, deballing and reballing a, a BGA component. Now, these are essentially additional thermal loads. Uh, to the component that traditionally it wouldn't see. These are, these are additional processes you need to undertake to ruggedize the component for these high, high reliability applications. Um, so there is the components, there is the refinishing process. I'll then go on to some of the challenges or some of the design uh, choices that you have in assembling the components on a circuit board and uh, some of the issues around reliability. I, I'm going to talk about QFNs here and micro BGAs, but also uh, do you underfill a micro BGA from formal coatings? What impact could the conformal coatings uh, have, particularly when you're using very low standoff height QFNs? So these are some of the, uh, the issues that the industry faces when they're both ruggedizing uh, the package and then uh, using certain materials at board assembly uh, that they need to understand how those materials will interact with the component and how that could impact subsequent reliability. Um, when we think about uh, avionics, um, this is a source here. Uh, from the US Air Force, uh, but temperature, thermal cycling is, is, is a primary uh, stress enhancer and, and one of the major issues uh, for electronic component uh, failure. My whole talk here will be focused on thermal only today, both in the refinishing process and in the board assembly. And of course, why is Temperature important uh, materials all have different material properties, i.e. coefficients of thermal expansion, which lead to stresses generating as the materials are heated up and cooled down. 
So commercial off-the-shelf components, um, now these components could be leaded components. Um, the industry is very conservative uh, with regards to the components they use uh, because of these reliability uh, constraints. Um, and I'd just like to point out here that lead-free solders are still an issue. Well, there's still a concern for this industry, and the industry is essentially exempt uh, from, from using lead-free solders due to the real high reliability uh, requirements. Challenges. Um, uh, ruggedizing these components. Um, uh, now, as I said before, COTS components, they would come uh, probably because they've been produced for a particular market, they would have high tin finishing on the components. Remember, I said before that tin whiskers is a is is still a concern. Uh, there's been a lot happening in conformal coatings to a, to mitigate that risk, but it still is a concern. So uh, these companies would look at uh, refinishing options, i.e., solder dipping. Uh, so here we could see this is a ro this is a robotically controlled system. I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment. Uh, but here, uh, the the leads of the component this is a leaded component. They are dipped into a solder bath. Uh, this is the clean off <coughs> the, the 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 high tin finishing uh, on on the components and and replace that with a different ref uh, 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 finishing. Also, for non-leaded components, i.e. Uh, BGAs, here we would, these, these could be bumped BGAs, but here we want to remove those balls from the components and put uh, compliant uh, solder balls back on. So that's deballing and reballing. As I said earlier, this all results in a, a, an additional thermal exposure to the to the component so what is the what is the impact of that thermal exposure to the component before it's assembled um uh, the other challenges is the assembly materials uh conformal coatings uh there are different conformal coatings that can be used these these have different properties uh modulus uh uh, glass transition temperatures and and coefficients of thermal expansion. Um, here you could see a conformal coating uh, around a, a, a particular package. I think this is a QFN. Um, now, what is the impact of conformal coatings on the solder joints and how you know, the penetration of these conformal coatings around the joints and potentially under the package can raise questions about subsequent uh, reliability uh, due to the interaction between those materials. Um, also, uh, here we can see um, uh, micro BGA components where we have the choice of using an underfill for the components and as well as placing conformal coating over the component and around the underfill. Um, uh, also, uh, Questions about the PCB. Could we use a compliant layer on the PCB to stress relieve those solder joints uh, compared to using a rigid PCB? Uh, so these are some of the questions that, that as, a, uh, as an electronic packaging engineer in this sector that you, you have and you're sort of looking out for answers to these. Okay, um, let me now just move on to uh, uh, modeling and metrology. So uh, I'm going to show you some uh, um, examples of how we've used uh, modeling and test uh, to, to address some of those questions that would arise, both in the refinishing process and the board assembly. Um, I think we've all heard of physics of failure. It's not a new term. I think the first physics of failure conference 
was back in the 1960s. Uh, so it's really using uh, test and uh, uh, models uh, to, to understand the physics of the failure. You know, what's driving a failure? What, what is the root cause of a failure? Of course, this is very different to the traditional handbook methods like 217, um, where we're really, whatever type of models you're using, you're trying to understand what's, what the stress is and what's driving that stress uh, across your assembly, uh, the electronic package assembly. Due to both accelerated load tests and operational loads, of course, as we know, when we do thermal cycling, which could be 125 down to minus 25, these are accelerated stress tests. How do they relate to um, normal loading that you would see in the field? Once you understand the stresses, or let's term that damage uh, in, say, for example, solder joints or die stress, then you have particular models that relate to whether a failure would occur or not, or the number of cycles to failure uh, when we have fatigue type failure mechanisms. Of course, then we would like to rank these failures and then identify uh, potentially acceleration factors that relates accelerated test to field behavior. That's a very high level overview of sort of physics of failure, but it is moving away from the traditional handbook methods uh, that are based on historical data uh, to um, uh, more physics of failure uh, uh, type techniques. As part of modeling, um, uh, you know, for over 20 um, well, the first finer element methods were used back in the 1960s, but with the compute power we have today and the, uh, uh, the ability to undertake you know, some very detailed simulations, um, we have things like computational fluid dynamics or finer element analysis, computational electromagnetics, and also to understand design variability, we can use techniques around optimization uh, techniques and design in the modeling world, it's design of simulations, but is equivalent to design of experiments. Now, all this can be done digitally. Um, and, and what we can solve today um, is, is significantly more than what we could do, say, 10 years ago with the compute power that we have today. Of course, running simulations like finite element analysis, um, it, they're great. Uh, there is a skill required to run these simulations. Um, but the simulations are only as good as the materials data that's provided uh, to the simulations. Um, uh, so I, I, I think there's a term in North America, which is garbage in, garbage out. And that is very, uh, very relevant when you don't have a good understanding of your materials and how they behave. Uh, and they, those are the inputs to these types of calculations. So, um, for companies in the aerospace sector, you know, they would purchase these COPS components. Uh, the components will come with a, uh, a, 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 a sheet um, that would describe uh, some, not all, some of the construction details very little detail on the materials that make up the package. Um, so you really need to start using very advanced uh, uh, metrology techniques uh, to really gain insight to what the materials are and what the actual construction of the package is um, uh, overall. Uh, so we have things like acoustic microscopy, SEM, X-ray, tomography, imaging, uh, CSAM, uh, these types of things. So it's really, for a COTS component, it's characterizing as much detail as you can, the materials and the construction of the package, and then that feeds in 
uh, to your CAD type models, finite element meshing, and then you start undertaking simulations. Doing this very early at the design stage enables you as a designer, a board designer, layout designer, to start thinking about those what if questions. Okay, so you know, it, I cannot emphasize more how modeling must work closely with the latest advances, and these advances are moving forward uh, in metrology to address the real needs for high quality input data uh, to some of these models. Um, also, I, I, I thought I'd just mention here, uh, in a moment, I'm going to go on to showing you examples of simulations for the refinishing and assembly processes. Uh, but also, uh, industry is very interested in, in how we could be using um, AI and machine learning in the future. And in the context of, uh, we've brought in a new part. How similar is that new component to a component that we've already thoroughly analyzed previously? We have huge amounts of data, test data, construction data, simulation results on a, another component that we've thoroughly analyzed in the past. Um, it's now in the field, it's working, um, but there's a wealth of knowledge there. When we bring in a new component, how can we analyze that component to say it is similar? How similar is it to a component we have used in the past? Now, because going through all this analysis and test and simulations is expensive and time consuming. So can we minimize how much of that we do when we bring in a new component? And I, there is a lot of interest in the, um, in the modeling and simulation world and, 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 and uh, reliability and how we can use AI and machine learning for uh, reliability and electronic packaging uh, design in the terms of productivity and cost reductions. Uh, so really, I'm just showing here uh, some of these techniques uh, that we've been working on, where a new part comes in, how similar is it, um, and whether you know how much detail, how much analysis we need to do on that part. This is of great benefit uh, to industry in, in understanding how similar components would be, new components are, to ones that have been used in the past. Okay, refinishing processes. So let me uh, start uh, with this process. So here, um, uh, a component, this is a leading component I, I'm illustrating here, uh, but this hot solder dip process, um, robotically controlled, uh, essentially the leads of this component uh, need to be dipped into a solder bath. Uh, to make those leads compliant with the application uh, uh, for, for, for an aerospace application. The primary concern here, one of the primary concerns is tin whiskers. Um, so here we can see uh, the actual uh, uh, robot arm system, uh, the sort of uh, uh, the fluxing, preheat, solder dipping, air cooling, water rinse and drying. And you've seen this picture before, but again, the leads being inserted into a, a solder bath. And, and here we illustrate that it, here's the COTS package. Um, there is interest here in optimizing uh, the refinishing process in terms of those thermal gradients that the component will see as it's placed in the hot solder bath and removed. Of course, when we think about the dye, uh, those, those thermal gradients, three degrees uh, change per period of time, uh, you know, we wanna keep the dye uh, within those safe limits when we, when we apply these additional thermal loads. Um, but also, uh, what is the impact 
of the internal construction to these thermal loads, in particular things like, you know, could we get peeling stresses that may occur? Uh, there could be some moisture in the package still that could enhance that. Um, so here we could see that uh, to get the construction of the internal package, the use of CT uh, tomography, I mean, that feeding right into the simulations to look at thermal behavior of the leads being dipped into the solder bath, and then also stress uh, throughout the package and those interfacial stresses between the copper and the molding compound. Uh, so here you could see uh, um, uh, an animation of that uh, component being dipped into the solder bath. Uh, these components uh, were also thermal coupled um, at, at different locations to see how temperatures changed in the package as it's dipped in the solder bath on each side. And, and here we could see uh, comparisons between the thermocouples and the experimental data. So here we have a, a, a real insight for, for a model that's been developed to understand how the temperatures change when we use different process conditions for this uh, hot solder bath uh, process. And then, of course, as I, I mentioned before, what type of stresses are, uh, is the process uh, putting into the package? Um, and here we could see the uh, calculations of the uh, of stress. These are peel stresses here. Um, as we go through different stages of the dipping process. So where you'll see here uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the peaks in stress, that's when uh, the, 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 the side of the package is dipped into the, into the solder bath. Uh, we, we were raised the question, um, if we expose the package to extreme temperature loads, uh, a big thermal shock, uh, you're predicting stresses, but could you predict delamination? And here we see the model prediction uh, when the, uh, the, the side of the package has been exposed to a very severe temperature load. Uh, so these are, are showing where it's read that delamination would occur. And, and for that particular package, uh, we could see here from the CSAM uh, uh, data where the delamination has occurred. So there's fairly good correlation there between the mo what the model is telling us and, and what actually happened uh, due to that thermal shock. You wouldn't do that in practice. This was just the test. It was answering the question that, yes, you're predicting stresses, but could you predict delamination as well? Uh, so that was a, a, a good validation example. Um, Chris, and, uh, sorry? 10 minutes. Yeah, OK. Uh, in summary, uh, that refinishing process uh, is, is safe, it's optimized. Um, but here we can see how modeling has been used with, uh, with uh, uh, a test uh, to, to understand the process. Um, hot nitrogen deballing, uh, these are for BGA components. Uh, the interest here, the questions being asked was, yes, we need to remove the balls and then place compliant solder balls onto the package. But this is, again, a temperature load. Um, what would be the influence of this process on not the second level solder joint, but the first level solder joints? So this is really a, a simulation identifying how the temperatures change. And here we can see the second level solder joint on the pad. Of course, that's quite a high temperature change as that ball is removed. Uh, but uh, what was good to see is not such a big change at the first level solder joint, which could be a different solder. Um, so there's a, a, an example there of how we have used modeling uh, uh, for that, uh, for deballing. And then we have laser reballing. Uh, so this is, this is sort of pack tech. Uh, process where we'll actually place new balls uh, on those pads. And here we could see how the temperatures again change. And as a liquid ball is placed 
On the pad, we could see how the temperature decreases over time, again at the same locations. Um, not a great change to the first level uh, solder joint. Um, and, and also you can see here where the solidification window is. Um, and understanding how solder joints solidify. This is uh, an example of a simulation here that's that droplet has been dropped onto the pad. And you can see how the solidification front moves up that liquid solder droplet um, uh, over time. So here we're moving into not just thermal mechanical, but uh, phase change. Uh, so the sort of multi-physics type calculations that are quite important. Okay, let me now move on to, so those are the refinishing type of processes, additional processes that are applied to these COTS components. So they can be used in these high reliability applications. One of the main concerns, as I said before, Tim Whiskers. Um, conformal coatings. Um, uh, we use these um, uh, to uh, essentially protect the, the PCB, but also as a possible mitigation uh, to tin whiskers. There are different types of conformal coatings, silicon-based, acrylic-based uh, conformal coatings. Uh, this is some work we did in looking at conformal coatings and the impact they may have on QFN type components. Uh, a lot of interest in QFNs, they're low standoff, um, and, uh, but, but you know, what is the impact of those conformal coatings on the solder joints? Uh, again, uh, COTS components, these would have been uh, C uh, uh, scanned and all that internal construction of the component then goes into a finer element mesh where we can then do uh, thermomechanical uh, type simulations. Um, also, uh, a lot of uh, accelerated life testing was done on these components. And with that data, together with the finer element simulations, you could start building a lifetime model, number of cycles to failure as a function of uh, plastic work. So the plastic work is the calculation from the finite element calculation, and uh, and then that's correlated with experimental uh, data. So the log NF here is from accelerated life testing. The log uh, W is from the finite element calculations. Um, here we could see different coatings. Uh, the conclusion here is that You've got to be careful with some of these compo co uh, coatings. Uh, uh, we, here we can see uh, damage in solder joints uh, with no coating. So the lower the damage, the better. Um, but with this particular coating, um, that it, it's interacting with the solder joints. There is an interaction there and it's leading to further damage. Um, so coating B was better here, coating A was, was problematic. In essence, when using a conformal coating, it reduces the CTE mismatch, uh, induced shear stresses and strain in the solder joint. That's a positive role, uh, but it constrains the outer plane movement of the solder joint. So there's two influences here happening when those solder joints are surrounded by a conformal coating. Um, we also looked here at edge bond uh, adhesive. Uh, generally, um, uh, these are very beneficial. You could see here uh, without an edge bond and with just the edge bond and with the conformal coating. So uh, this is damage. Again, reducing the damage is beneficial for a subsequent reliability. So the use of edge bond is a, is, is a really good material to use. Five minutes, Chris. Thank you, Paul. I'm nearly there. OK, let me now move on to uh, micro BGAs, very small BGAs. And uh, in this um, uh, application, uh, we were looking at PCBs that are rigid or compliant. 
and also looking at underfills and edge bond uh, materials. Uh, so there was a number of different scenarios that we were interested in here. Um, the rigid PCB, uh, it's a standard PCB, but the compliant one has a compliant layer just here under the solder resist. So that is a, 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 a lower modulus, but a much higher CTE compliant layer. Uh, so as well as the PCB compliant layer, one, we've also looked at edge bond and underfills for these BGAs. Um, remember these are BGAs, not flip chips, and but you still consider underfills for these types of uh, uh, components. Um, extensive reliability testing, uh, undertaken on these components, uh, what we we could see was underfills really good. Um, you could see here uh, we're at nearly 11,000 cycles, still no failure. Uh, but with a rigid board with no resin or a rigid board just with edge bond, much lower cycles to failure, characteristic life here. Uh, the compliant layer it is good particularly with underfills um, and is reasonably good also with edge bond that was a, a failure at eight eight thousand eight hundred there uh, but just the compliant board with out of resin it doesn't really provide any benefits you do need resins here either edge bond or underfills uh, detailed finer element model uh, models uh, 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 developed here, uh, including the underfills or the edge bond with the conformal coating. Uh, comparison, uh, we got very good comparisons here between the test data that I just showed and the, uh, and the simulations. Again, without using a resin, um, here we've got the compliant board and the rigid board, but without using a resin, not much benefit. That was, we didn't expect that, but that, that was the case. It was also seen in the, in the test. But when using the edge bond or the underfill, significant benefits for these components. Here again, bringing together test data with simulation data, you can start generating these physics of failure models, models that relate cycles to failure to damage. Um, uh, in essence, the, the findings here, um uh, for the for the uh, looking at a rigid board or this compliant board uh not not a great difference uh, due to a number of reasons here um but uh uh you do need a resin as well whether it's a rigid or a uh, a compliant board um here we can see when uh, no resin is used that the damage well, the crack will initiate at the top of the joint. When we use an edge bond or an underfill, the damage moves to the, the other side of the joint. Um, but generally here, uh, the edge bond or the underfill with a micro BGA is very beneficial to solder joint uh, reliability. Okay, in, in conclusion, um, I've presented um, uh, some examples here of uh, some of the challenges that aerospace industry faces. They, they need to use what we call COTS components. I've talked about refinishing those components, uh, particularly great concerns about high tin uh, finishing on these components. The issue is tin whiskers, as well as uh, concerns about the reliability of lead-free solders. Uh, so you've got either hot solder dipping or deballing and reballing, uh, and then I've talked a bit about uh, conformal coatings, edge bond, and underfills, and also the option of a rigid board co compared to a compliant PCB. Uh, for those micro BGAs, I, I showed that you know both the test and the uh, modelling and simulation is it, certainly uh, suggesting that for those you do need an underfill or a, um, an, an edge bond resin uh, to enhance reliability. Uh, finally, I, I just like to uh, say that, uh, you know, this is all designed for reliability we're looking at here. It's a very niche uh, sector. 
uh, a small sector when it comes to the semiconductor industry. But there is a great need for multi-physics modeling, that close linking with metrology. Uh, we are going to hear a lot more about machine learning and AI and how we use that with the wealth of data we, we have. Uh, finally, I'd just like to mention the heterogeneous roadmap. Again, three chapters mention uh, and discuss reliability, and I've detailed those here. Um, for those who are interested in seeing more of this work, there's a list of publications here. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for listening to this presentation. I'd like to acknowledge our industrial partners. Thank you very much.